Hello world. Good evening, everyone. How delightful that you chose to join this live stream for yet another round of brisky thoughts about the pressing challenges of our times. I am Anne Tolzeit and I happily welcome you to the economy panel of the Driving the Human Festival. By now, I'm sure we all know that the global pandemic still in full swing has brought once more and more so novel urgency to the drive towards a critical evaluation of our economic system and to the need of genuinely shifting gears to alternative action beyond the comfort level zones. As homo economicus, we do cherish local and global marketplaces to offer our services and trade goods of various kinds, be it fruits, be it minerals, vaccine, artworks or information of any kind, don't we? As sentient human beings, we recognize a great deal of socioeconomic imbalance and face nagging questions such as how to come up with prototypes for creating balance within the systems and caring for these networks of which we are part of in different roles. How can we do less harm as producers and consumers? Where can we leave things for the better? And where can we create livelihood and value through fair and meaningful exchange? without being trapped all the time by the monetary profit principle. John Thackeray, who is an, an investigator of all things related to ecological design and social innovation, who travels the world collecting stories, connecting people and helping to think about the future. John, who was the first director of the Netherlands Design Institute in Amsterdam and who developed the conference series Doors of Perception and who just released a new book entitled How to Thrive in the Next Economy. John, with this video interview we were just watching, provides a very proper mood and mind board for our panel discussion. As he points out, the urgency to build networks of connectivity between the social, the ecological and the economic, he himself refers, as we have heard, to Ilya Prigozhin's work of complex systems and self-organization, who put it in a nutshell, and I repeat the quote, when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system, unquote. As moderator, it is now my honor to connect you to our three awe-inspiring panelists, Susanne Kartner, Michelle Bowens, and Richard De Wolf. Susanne, Michelle and Richard, very warm welcome to you. We are extremely thankful and excited that you share your expertise with us and your fervor about how to foster economic change that better safeguards the intricate and multifold interconnected life on the planet in a complex world of physical and digital, of material and immaterial goods. Before we jump into the discussion and let the important questions nag us and get the better of us, let me quickly introduce you to tonight's audience. The audience, if you have come across the Circular Economy Initiative in Germany, then you know Susanne Kartner. She pioneered the Circular Economy Initiative at the National Academy of Science and Engineering, short ACATEC, where she works together with a lot of different stakeholders from politics to science, industry and civil society. And let me mention once again that Akatec is one of the strong partners of the Driving the Human Project. Susanne has a sophisticated scholarly background in chemistry and marine microbiology. She has been working for the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, where, among many other things, she co-authored the fifth assessment report as the scientific basis for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris, and as we recall, the Paris Agreement signed in 2016 deals with the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Are you familiar with the proposal of common centered economy? If so, I'm sure you have been following the publications and talks of Michelle Bowens all along, and you are waiting for Michelle's massive open online course to be released. Michelle founded the Foundation for Peer-to-Peer -peer Alternatives. He works with this global group of researchers exploring peer production, governance and property towards a society of the commons. Michelle is research director of the platform commonstransition.org, co-founder of the Commons Strategy Group. He organizes powerful conferences in this context. And I can only recommend to you the 
peer-to-peer -peer manifesto. It beautifully makes transparent that the commons are not a paradise of free floating milk and honey, but a picnic prepared by all, which you would be sorry not to be attending. And most of all, he is such an excep exceptional sport. As for him, this panel is a real late night show, way past midnight. Michelle, you are the best. And while Michelle joins in from early Sunday morning, Richard graciously devoted the best time of his Saturday early afternoon to us. So, well, if you are in care about democracy at work as a means to economic justice and have an urge for mind-stunning lectures and texts on economy, you must be well acquainted with Richard E. Wolf. Richard is Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and lectures and publishes widely and with great passion. The sickness is the system when capitalism fails to save us from pandemics or itself, is his latest book. Don't skip it, but read it, share it, discuss it with friends and colleagues and pass it on. So as you can hear, we got quite some common interests and compassionate fire burning here on the panel against symptoms of cooling off and crystallizing in crisis. Please, the audience, feel cordially invited to connect to this energy of the panel and contribute to the conversation via the driving the human telegram chat. Julian, one of the moderators, will bring in your questions at the end and you prepare them on the telegram chat. So Richard, let's start the conversation. And I think when we think about economic change, changing the system, we have to talk at first a little bit about values. When we talk about economic change, what comes to your mind when we think about economic value issues that you observe today when you look at differences and similarities between Europe and the US? And as you do, you always take also an historical perspective on it. Thank you very much, uh, Annette. And I appreciate very much this opportunity to have a conversation um, with all of you. I thought John Thackeray's comment about we are living through unwinding of capitalism, unwinding of neoliberalism, uh, really struck me very deeply. I am speaking to you from New York in a society that is now, and I have never said this before, in my judgment, disintegrating. It is more than unwinding. It cannot cope with the COVID virus. It cannot cope with its extreme a crash of its capitalist economic system, its internal racial problems, its failure to deal with the climate. These are problems that have all come together and they give this country, all of us, a sense of disintegration. The election we have just gone through and which is not yet resolved is a symptom. The president who lost that election is a symptom. And unfortunately, the president about to replace him is also a symptom. This is a society not only an extremist of unwinding, to use John's phrase, but it has no idea how to cope. And as a result, it is beginning to ask what have been taboo questions about basic values and about basic questions in economics and to look for, without being explicitly aware of it, those islands of difference uh, that John referred to. One of those islands is, in my judgment, and I am an economist by training and by profession, has to do with how we organize the economy. And while that is an obvious question, you might be surprised to know that while the profession has spent a great deal of time trying to understand how to accomplish uh, the exchange of goods with one another, or how to explain the prices at which they exchange, the organization of the process itself has gotten very little attention. And it is our conviction, certainly mine, that that is no accident, that the refusal to deal with that question hides a desire not to be confronted with one of those little islands that speaks volumes. So let me very briefly outline the values that we have that bring us to this. 
They are ironically the values with which capitalism came into the world. You know, the French Revolution with liberté, égalité, fraternité, uh, the American Revolution, which added democracy. These values, which were used to justify the transition from feudalism to capitalism, those values which brought many to support a capitalism they otherwise would not have supported, those values have not been realized by capitalism. We don't have equality. We don't have fraternity. We don't have democracy. We don't have any of those things. And yet they were promised. And the interesting question is, why was the promise not kept? I take at their value the promises of those original strugglers for capitalism that they wanted those things, but they haven't been able to produce them. We have a capitalism that is unstable every four to seven years, an economic crash. We have a capitalism that has taken us in this country back to a level of inequality we thought we had put aside a century ago. We have a system that cannot protect our public health, cannot secure jobs for tens of millions of our citizens. Well, then where might we find the values of liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy? My answer, and the answer I think is the promise of the future, a human future, is to face the fact that we organize in capitalism our enterprises, factories, stores, offices, in a fundamentally anti-democratic way. A tiny group of people at the top make the key decisions. They decide what the enterprise produces, what technology it uses, where the production occurs, and what is done with the product that everybody has helped to produce. The mass of the people, the employees, do not participate in those decisions, certainly not in a decisive way. Democracy would require it, but capitalism has simply nullified democracy in the workplace. That is its hallmark, and that is the roots of its failure. The inability to overcome inequality is because the tiny group at the top in every enterprise arrogates to itself the bulk of the wealth. That's why all the programs to overcome inequality are either ineffective or much less effective than all of us would wish them to be. The obstacle we can deal with is to transform the workplace, to finally bring the values of democracy and equality right in to the core of all enterprises. One person, one vote. We decide together democratically what we produce, how we produce, where we produce, and what we do with the output. Yes, that's a revolutionary transformation. But without it, the projects of capitalism, including the values most of us support, will continue not to be realized. I wanted to stop because I want to give time to others. And you know, professors like me have a tendency, if you allow them, just to keep going like a little wind-up toy. <laughs> Thank you. Susanne Kartner, would you like to continue? Thanks, Richard, for your very, very interesting and good, good first uh, yeah, introduction to this topic, introduction of value, introduction of um, responsibilities that we all carry in the economy. And I'd like to take it from there, talking about our perspective of values in a circular economy. Um, because some of the points you raised certainly resonate with me and some of the criticism I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up as well. Um, what we think is certainly that when we talk about a circular economy, we need a new understanding of values, that's for sure. If we look back since the 1950s, how, how progress is measured, it's really interesting to see. GDP, gross, dom uh, gross domestic product has gone up, but if you look at other indicators, for example, um, like the genuine progress indicator, we see it has leveled. So 
there is limited societal progress and most certainly from the environmental perspective, it has been disastrous. We've seen some of the consequences of what we have done to our environment. So this means our current linear model of production and consumption has, us, has brought us to the point where we are now. And this is due to the fact that some of those, well, mostly we produce things, materials, products, just to use them and then to dump them and or to burn them. And if we want to change this, we think this needs to be a fundamental change of the values. So in the past or at current, when we look at value creation, this is when labor turns resources into products or materials. And that has been sort of the focus of our sort of like economic model so far. And this is what we measure with gross dom domestic product, for example. But if we want to make this transition into a circular economy, we need to think about value retention. I think this is very crucially important. In Germany, we have a long tradition, of course, to well look at this value retention, but we talk about recycling and again, this is very much at the end of life of products where we are starting to intervene. But these interventions, this retention needs to come much earlier before we sort of like um, dump things because they don't work anymore. There are different levers that we can use. We need to repair things. We need to remanufacture them. We can sell them as new with new added warranties, for example. We need to share products much more. So the, the, the utilization levels are, are much higher. And there is a slow development that we see that value retention becomes interesting. There are being certain business models are being developed, but we are at the very beginning of this at the moment. Um, also, and that's another point, because some of these um, business models for value retention are prohibitively expensive at the moment. They're very much labor intensive. But there is no, there is um, limited incentives for businesses to go there because the taxes on labor are really high. And in contrast to that, the taxes on resources are sometimes very low or they're sometimes even subsidized. So that's really sort of like a crucial conflict that we are facing there. The third point is I think we need to have a new appreciation of value for each of us in society. And um, there needs to be a a, a clearness about that every product and all the material that we use comes with a certain environmental footprint. You know, it's taken out of the earth, its production has used resources, water, soil, for example, or something like that. And so the, the prices that we see of those products is not reflective of what they really are. So we need this true cost pricing as a very fundamental change of how we deal with these, with these things. There is an idea, the so-called x tax project, and I like to bring this into the discussion as well, because it says tax pollution, not people, you know, because our current system, we've seen it, it causes unemployment, Richard has mentioned this, it causes overconsumption and it causes pollution, so we have to reverse this logic. And one way to reverse this logic is to create different incentives, and one of that is this sort of called x tax approach where we raise the taxes on resources, which are finite, and we reduce this resources at the taxes on, on labor to have a different sort of yeah, incentive um, that these, these models, these, these more labor intensive models can really be implemented. So to, to bring this up together, I think I said, at the one hand side, we need this true cost pricing approach. We need to see what the tree, true impact of our consumption is of those production methods that we have. And that's the next step. We also need to refocus from this pure value creation to a different mode of understanding what progress is. And I think this is a discussion that certainly does not just happen in the precincts of a circular economy discussion, but here we focus on well-being. We focus on the question uh, of what do we measure? Is it really just GDP or do we really need other indicators to tru truly show us the progress that we are making or that we are not making? Um, and a really, really fundamental discussion in society, what contributes for us to, a, to an individual quality of life that's really sort of like not necessarily defined by the consumption levels that we have or the economic status that we uh, enjoy. So, and with that, I think I would like to hand over to Michelle because I think um, you have thought a lot about this and the, yeah, your investigations into the, into the comments probably reflect some of those thoughts as well. Thank, thank you. Um, yes, I, I'm 
quite complementary in my work to what John Takara said, and what he calls these uh, islands of coherence, uh, but I call them seed forms. And the reason I call them seed forms is because I think that every huge transformation in the past was also a value revolution. Think about feudalism where the value is in the land, uh, and then in capitalism, it's really labor productivity, right? So it's it, it was a change in a value regime. And so what I'm saying is that the we are we see the emergence of a new value regime, which is a contributory value regime. So when I talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, I mean that we that we have this capacity right now to scale cooperation at a translocal and transnational level. And that, for example, you know, you do permaculture, which may seem like a small thing, and you have your feet in the mud, you're very local. But today you're connected to the global network of all permaculturists, and you're learning from each other practically in real time. So we're creating these um, new value networks, which work around a contributory value regime. And I want to briefly explain what that is. So if you have the capacity to contribute to a common project, and what we call without permission as now happening in free software, open design, you don't want only a few people to capture the value because everybody in the, in the network has collaborated, right? So you start seeing the world not, not as a commodity thing that is produced by paid labor, but as a common value that is produced by contributions. And then you engage with the market, but it's already derivative from the common value. And so here's the problem. The way we see value, and that includes the left, is we see value as coming from extraction, is by extracting from labor and nature that we create wealth. And so all the people who are engaged in actually healing the world, in, in doing care, in generating you know, better communities and improving the web of life rather than destroying it, they are not funded because that is not recognized as value. So we need either taxation or philanthropy to fund the people who are doing good things. And that is fundamentally wrong. And I think it's also uh, in harmony with what you say about you know, measuring value differently. So we have to look at contributory value. And, and basically what I think is we have to look at how to fund this more directly. And I want to give you an example to make that clear. So in France, there is a very successful community land trust movement. And uh, it has like a 100 million euro capital. It buys up land, puts it in a trust so that it can give cheap rent to organic farmers, which otherwise cannot uh, find a means to do that. And so they've calculated already in 2011, uh, 16, sorry, that their work is saving the French state 350 million euro in depollution costs. So there you have the problem, right? Positive externalities are not counted. Facebook does not recognize that its value is co-created by all the people using it because otherwise they would have no attention to sell. Uh, and this is really systematic uh, in our society. So the point I'm then making is that we have to recognize the commons as a real institution. So it's not just anymore about the state and the market and the left saying, you know, we need more state to regulate the market and, and distribute in a more fair way. Uh, or the right saying we need more freedom so that we can, you know, have more entrepreneurship. Both are forgetting that there's something new, which is the commons. And we need to recognize the commons. And especially in an era where we're destroying the planet, historically, you know, whenever an extractive regime overused its, its regional planetary boundaries, when it wanted to collapse, the commons came up as the healing mechanism. And we thought we had escaped this, you know, under capitalism because of technology innovation. We didn't. We just postponed it for 400 years. And now the whole earth is, is in collapse. So that's why I think we, we need the commons as, a, you know, a core of our society with the state, a partner state to support it and a generative market to support it. So adapting market and state forms to the needs of the you know contributors in the commons so i switch now to the the second issue which is the systems uh, i want to make two points about this i just mentioned the partner state and why this is so important so in italy 
we had the Bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons. So what is that? That is a public commons cooperation protocol. The first year they had 100 projects, the second year 300 projects. Today, 250 cities have taken that over and one, one million Italians are engaged in urban commonings in improving and caring for their urban resources. So that's a bit different from the traditional kind of top-down bureaucratic uh, policy making. This is about really seeing the government as enabling and empowering the autonomy of the people. So when Richard talks about you know, the democracy uh, in production, that's exactly what I mean also, but also in civic society. Uh, the commons is by definition a self-managed community. Uh, so in a commons, like in a co-op, the, the, the ground floor is democracy. And, and so this is very important, I think, um, that we, we look at this system change. And so the other thing, and then I, I, I will, uh, I think I have to give it back to Richard, but I, I want to say one more thing. So a lot of people are pessimistic and say, well, you know, we see this happening, the commons is growing, but it's going to be co-opted by, by capital. So they kind of already given themselves, uh, you know, defeated before it even started. And so I think we should just do the opposite. So not co-optation by capital, but reverse co-optation. We should have policies as commoners that we create new kinds of common property. So we can call this uh, non-dominium. You know, it's like a collective. It belongs to all the commoners, basically, who are engaged in the project. And um, I use a notion of transvestment, which means using capital to grow the commons. Well, and capital is actually the opposite. It enclosed the commons to create capital. And so now what we have to do is the opposite. We have to systematically engage all these you know, uh, islands of coherence that John Tucker talked about, we have to start becoming very serious about this. This is a structural issue. And we need the state and the market to, de to co-evolve with the commons to make this a new norm. Once we recognize the value of contributions, we will be in a new society, a new civilization where care of community and the web of life becomes the core way of actually getting recognition as human beings. And this is where we have to go. Not, not being recognized because we're good extractors, but being recognized for being good contributors. Thank you. And Richard, I think it's your turn about system change. Okay. I agree, as you might have expected, with both of you, with Michelle and with Suzanne. But I want to push a little bit on the systems. In my reading, capitalism certainly got rid of the commons. We know that story uh, at risk of quoting the wrong person for some of you uh, in the first volume of Capital, Section 8 at the end is about the so-called transition from feudalism to capitalism. And a central part of the story Karl Marx works out there is the destruction of the commons, the agricultural commons, the enclosure of those commons and so on. Uh, and I'm reminded that throughout the history of, of capitalism, it always produced a bad conscience. Somewhere the employer knows that he's ripping off the employees. Oh sure, he or she denies it. Oh sure, they give examples. But fundamentally, what they say and listen to in church on Sunday is the same thing they ignore uh, the rest of the days of the week, which is part of why they go on Sunday to feel less awful about who they are and what they do. Why do I say it? Because the efforts to create those islands are also opportunities for the system to identify those islands and to undo them in a variety of ways. Undo the very effort to be collective, to be communitarian, to be cooperative. So I don't want that bad outcome again. So when I listen to Michel, I say to myself, absolutely, these are the values that are being bringing people to the projects of the commons. 
But in order for them not to be undone, we have to at the same time directly confront and transform where the awful authoritarian, hierarchical, anti-democratic organizational power and impulse comes from. And that's from the enterprises, the capitalist enterprises that dominate the world of production uh, and circulation now. It, it, another way of putting it, we teach in economics that there are those costs and those benefits which the capitalist has to pay as a cost and gets into his hands as a benefit. And that those are all the costs that matter. So those are the only ones that they count. And then we have our Suzanne and others pointing out absolutely that there are those externalities, those costs not counted by this system, which we now have to fix the damage to our planet done by a capitalism that did not want to and was not forced to count the costs of its own behavior. I don't expect capitalists to be willing to change any of that. I live in a society where I'm taught that lesson literally every day. So therefore, for me to be the ally to Michelle and Suzanne, I want to be, pushes me to say, it is as has been understood. It is the system too, the system that we have organized the bulk of our production that has to be directly confronted and transformed in alliance with the projects for a commons, absolutely. And the commons can be a model for that which we do in the enterprise, absolutely agreed. But I do wanna stress that we live in what is still very much a capitalist system and the folks who make business off of that are determined to keep it. And we have to face that and make part of our strategy the confrontation and we can now do it because the model of a worker cooperative is an alternative to which people disgusted with capitalism. And I live in a country where there are more of those people than I have ever seen or expected to see in my lifetime in this country. They're looking for something to go to. And these models of cooperative, not just in some common in the community, but in their workplace where they go five days a week and spend the bulk of their time, the idea that that could be transformed becomes itself a revolutionary consciousness. So let me turn it back to Suzanne. <laughs> Richard, thanks for this challenge of responding to you now. I'm trying my best. <laughs> well, I think the first point is that I want to make is, is go back to what you said about those efforts to build those islands of coherence. And if I'm looking at this through my circular economy glasses, it's very interesting and it's very nice to see what is happening there. You know, it's, it's, it's changes are taking place in this appreciation of the value of resources. There are neighborhood initiatives where you lend each other products that you use very rarely, drillers or ladders or things like that, you know, and there's connections being built. Um, you learn to meet new people which you haven't met before. So it's this little establishment of networks through sharing of resources which i think is is, is great uh, joining or sharing knowledge on how to repair products like these repair cafes i just mentioned so i think this is sort of like a first step where a different approach to using resources can contribute to building these sort of like islands of coherence where the social interaction plays an important part, but also the sort of like understanding that we need to have a new way of handling um, and, 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 and being respectful to the products and things and materials that we surround ourselves with. Having said that, I think I wouldn't go as far to having this drastic um, criticism or well I share some of the points of the criticism that you make to our current capitalist system because I think we have the wrong indicators in it to measure the progress we have orientated ourselves in the wrong values of what what we need that well-being well and in the individual um, quality of life is something we need to orientate ourselves and the progress for so I think this is dysfunctional I fully agree 
But I also think that we need to use this system and be pragmatic to, to make changes for the better. And I'm saying this because knowing about the, the environmental and the climate crisis that we are in, we need to make progress immediately. And I think the only way to make progress quickly is to work with companies and to show them there's a way of um, making business which is not so harming to the environment as we have done previously. We can show that there are different models um, where you can survive on as a business. And if you change your model from selling products and hoping they go bust as much as, as early as possible because then you can sell new ones, um, we need to change our thinking about this. Maybe the first step, you offer repair services as a package uh, with this product because then the incentive for you as a company of obviously are higher that it doesn't go dysfunctional so quickly. Um, the next step would be that you rent or you lease these systems, for example, and again, you stay responsible for that they work as good and as long as possible because otherwise it costs you money. Or you really go this really big next step um, where you have these results oriented services where the consumer or the user basically just pays you, if we take the example of a washing machine, per washing cycle. And you stay the owner of this washing machine, you have to take it back if it goes um, bust and that has, makes you responsible for how you build this system and you're going to build it as long lasting as possible, otherwise it's going to cost you money. So I think in that respect, businesses and companies can be your partners in being and forming and creating this transition. But I need to add this as well. We as, as, as citizens play an important part in that. And I'm saying this because there is, in Germany, I don't know whether this is being used elsewhere in the world. When you talk about car sharing, there are people saying, um, don't be gentle, it's a rental. And I have to say, I really hate this. Just because you don't own it doesn't mean you can treated badly because if it if it gets broken it's not your responsibility and that i think shows the fundamental societal change that we need also in how we deal with our environment and the resources it provides to us um, so going back um to, to to what i said you know we as a as a as a citizen as a consumer we can be part of those networks we can maybe also engage with companies as we uh, sort of like become prosumers in the design processes of these of these products um, or if we take uh, um, renewable energy systems if we put those panels on our roofs and sell some of the electricity that we are generating um, and also in the broader sort of network perspective coming back to sort of the, the business level i don't think that um, we can rest with this idea that um, companies can do this transition into a circular economy alone. And here we come to sort of the core basis of it because in a circular economy, cooperation is key. So there's not a single company we can, which can implement a circular business model, for example. You need an ecosystem for that. You need different actors for that. And for them to cooperate and really start a management or, or circular management of those, of those uh, products, there needs to be transparency, there needs to be trust, and there needs to be this sense of cooperation. And I think this can provide the basis really to start a transition into a different handling of how we use resources, but also of how we cooperate with each other in a society society and with businesses. Thank you, Susanne. Maybe we have five more minutes before we ask the audience to bring in their questions. Michelle, could you maybe point out from your experience where some of the frictions were in, in different projects you were following or fostering? Yeah, well, Certainly one of the internal problems is, uh, you know, governance. It's, um, you know, there's kind of a tension between the old vertical worlds, you know, in a, in a, in a corporate hierarchy. Um, and then there's a very strong demand for horizontalism. And personally, I don't think those, both of those extremes are not the ideal. Uh, we have to really find hybrid mechanisms because the, the very important thing that I find in commons is they also have to be efficient. 
we you know we are competing whether we want it or not with capitalist enterprises so we, we also have to show that we can do things you know products that don't break down services that are better and so that requires uh, a kind of combination between inclusion horizontality but also capacity to kind of you know uh, deal with contracts do the work know who's responsible uh, so that's that's one of the things that that we often see in in, in common spirit is how to to navigate this contradiction um, politically uh, in the world we you know I see a, a big problem with the regression to identity that is both visible on the left and on the right on the right it's you know ethno nationalist religious revival uh, you know we've seen in right-wing populism uh, on the left it's around uh, you know intersectionality and, and race and gender and so we see that people are retreating to smaller identifications. And so there's a lot of internal stru uh, struggle and polarization, uh, which is really difficult to deal with when you build a social movement. Uh, so that's, that's an issue that we have now. So, and I think the, the answer there is, we really have to learn to talk to everyone again, uh, you know, go beyond our own, even political identity and being able to say, well, you know, if we all care for this thing, we should be able to work together regardless. And, and certain things we just have to put between brackets within a certain context in order to be, uh, you know, work together. So that's the second point. Then finally, the third point, uh, which is we really have to convince political movements to step away from the market state binary. As long as you, as this is your reality, then you know you you're stuck in the industrial framework. Uh, it reinforces state or reinforce the market, and and that is even true for progressive parties, which think also think like capital that the value comes from extraction. So we I think we need to convince uh, also progressive political forces that value comes from contribution, and so that the commons are not a threat to you know taxation and redistribution but are actually something new that they, they can embrace. And, and that's not always an easy thing to do in the current uh, context. Thank you so much, Michelle. Julian, do we have any comments, questions from the audience yet? We certainly do. We probably have more than we can deal with, but I'm trying to, to give you a few. There was one um, spearheaded by Alexia, and I hope I um, represent you well here, Alexia, so I'm trying to get your question right. So the question is about where are all the non-humans, I guess? So they made an appearance in classic economic terms um, as externalities in several times. And so the question is, if there's a paradox, you know, um, and if we don't, like in this uh, idea of a circular economy, if it excludes living things, and if we must not move from a circular economy to an economy of the living, and what that could look like and what the place of that kind of question would be in your analysis. I think this would be a nice answer from Susanna and Michelle, if you could have a quick exchange about it. Susanna, do you want to start? I'm, I'm going to start and then hand over to you. So um, yeah. thank you for this question. It's certainly a challenging one. And I wouldn't want to go as far that it's sort of... Um, a circular economy as such looks at just as as resources so the the non-living material if you if you look at the sort of impacts our current economy has our linear system has it's certainly climate change it's certainly the the frightening recession of biodiversity that we have seen um, this is something that we are aiming for to fix through a circular economy so of course when we want to look at the progress that a circular economy makes as well it is very important that we also are challenged to use the right indicators. And as we bring our products being brought on the market in a circular economy, of course, do you have to look at the impact this has not only on resource use, on water and soils, but also on indicators which show you has a toxicity to humans, has a toxicity to freshwater uh, systems and uh, the ecology in there. So this is part of the whole sort of systemic perspective that you need to take in a certain uh, circular economy, most certainly. Um, 
So that would be sort of like my direct response to this question of sort of like what is involved and what perspective in, is involved. And with that, I would hand over to you, Michelle. Yeah, so uh, I think even in the commons, we have this issue where, you know, the classic uh, commons theory from Ostrom, you know, sees humans and resources as separate things. And so I think, and that's, of course, a very difficult thing to do because we have been, you know, educated for four centuries uh, uh, in this kind of separation ideology, is to see living things as, as partners. Uh, so not just as resources that we use, but kind of a recognize it in the dependence. Now, how can we practically do that? It's a difficult question, but I, I'm going to give you an example which some people may not like, but I, I think it's an interesting way of thinking. So as you know that, you know, New, New Zealand, Bolivia, Ecuador have started to give uh, legal personhood uh, to natural resources. And let me add a little twist to that. So today we have uh, blockchain technology and I'm not hot on blockchain per se. I'm talking really about what it enables, which is distributed and shared accounting and logistics. That's what I'm interested in. The fact that we can now create ecosystems. And um, there is a second concept in this movement, which is called distributed autonomous organization. So I just ask you to let your imagination go for a while. Imagine that we could recognize a forest and a river ecosystem as actually ecosystems with agency, enabled through uh, technology, uh, agents, sensors, that trust, that natural trust could basically recognize that it depends also on humans to protect itself. So I don't know if you see the, re the reasoning, but what I'm, what I'm seeing as a possibility is to have recognized natural resources surrounded by human and extra human contributors, and that can actually uh, start paying them. So in other words, recognizing commons-based contributions in, in a new institution. So maybe that's not realistic, but I think very much in that direction is that we need the commons to be a fifth magisteria. We have now culture, politics, science, I always forgot the fourth one, the economy that kind of like relatively autonomously manage our systems. And we have no voice for the commons. And I think the commons is both human communities and extra human communities. We need to find the legal forms that give them somehow a kind of voice that can be taken into account in our human decision-making. And just to finish one, one minute. So I wrote a report about this. It's called uh, P2P Accounting for Planetary Survival. And so I look at new accounting systems like contributory accounting, ecosystem accounting, and thermodynamic accounting. So imagine that we have a layer of mutual coordination to what we call stigmergy, which was, you know, what open source has brought to the world, the capacity to massively scale cooperation. Second, we create generative market mechanisms like Fishcoin, which is a coin using fisheries, which tells you exactly how much fish we can use without endangering their reproduction. So we have intelligent monetary systems that actually integrate those externalities. And then we have a third layer which some people call global thresholds and allocations, which is really the voice of nature. It says, you know, this humanity is what you can use without destroying and overusing the planet. And imagine that we have a cyber physical infrastructure where in every context we can determine how much we can use for human needs without endangering the planet. But it's a question of power. So I, you know, what Richard, uh, reacted to my presentation, that is very much true. It's a, a good idea, doesn't work if you, there's no power behind it, right? So this requires political and social struggle to recognize these new types of institutions which represent that common value and that it also includes non-human actors. That's basically, I think, the direction I want to go in. Annette, could I add a thought? Yes, yes, yes please. The reason I press on the transformation of the capitalist economic system 
is because it inculcates in the populations where capitalism is the prevailing system, ways of thinking that are the direct problems that both Suzanne and Michelle talk about. For example, the capitalist system says there is a single metric, profit, which rationalizes and justifies investment. You invest where the profit is probably the highest. This notion that you can reduce the complexity of an investment, a decision of how to use resources with all of its consequences, this complexity doesn't have to be answered in capitalism. The only question is, does it enhance my profit probably over the next two to three years? What it does in the long run, I'm not going to be here. I don't have to. This is not the way the system works. It rewards me for doing what's profitable and punishes me for calculating all the externalities or even wasting my time thinking about it. We have a problem in our projects, valuable as they are, that they're constantly being undone by the logic of a capitalist system that seeps its way in to the culture and mentality of the very people we try to reach. That's why the transformation of that system has to be part of our project or we will not succeed. Thank you, Richard. So we Julian? do one, one more short mm -hmm. question. because We just got a nice one coming in from, um, from YouTube, actually. First of all, thanks for the great panel from Leonora. And she would like your advice to a kid. What would you recommend? What would you say? What is the most important thing to keep in your mind and heart when you start contributing to society? And maybe we do a short round of that and close with this. Richard, would you like to start? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, I think for me, it, it's to understand that the consequences of any act are infinite in number. You cannot know what they all are. Many of them will not play out until you are no longer on the scene. Therefore, anyone who suggests to you there is the metric, the way, whether it's GDP or anything else, is giving you bad advice that life is a very complicated business. Your best hope is to work with other people, acknowledging that they see it and experience it differently, and then try to come up with suggestions and conclusions that take as much as they can those differences into account and be very suspicious of anyone who tells you there's a shortcut, there's the profit motive, or there's the aggrandizement of our nation, or there's the celebration of whoever we think lives in the sky. These are not the ways forward. These have been the ways that we have to get beyond. Susanne, would you like to continue? <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm. Uh, yeah, I think for me it's really just a few words um, that I want to say. For me, I think it would be be respectful to everything and everybody who surrounds you. Always try to take the other per person's perspective. Try to be understanding, and that's the basis for this cooperation, for this uh, I know it's miteinander to say it in German, mm -hmm. um, or the way of interacting. And I think this would be a good basis that I would want to give to a kid to shape our future. Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, I, I would uh, ask uh, him or her four difficult questions. One is, what do you think the world needs right now? The second question is, what, what kind of passion can you bring that is in harmony with, with this particular need? The third one is, what skills do you need to make that effective? And the fourth question, of course, very important as well is, how do you think you can make a livelihood based on the three first uh, requirements? And I know that's a, quite a difficult uh, thing to do, but I think that's what's great about, you know, what we call commons-based peer production. It starts from the passion. The passion starts a project, the projects create an econo uh, a community, and the community creates the economy. So we kind of have 
the logic around the capitalist logic, which is how can I make a living? And maybe I find a nice job and maybe I will be happy doing that job, which is one out of five people succeed in doing that. And the second way that I propose is more difficult because you're taking a big risk. Uh, but eventually, you know, in terms of social change, it's very efficient because you're not waiting for capital to finance your activity. You're, you're doing it and then you try to create a, a community and an economy around it. So that's kind of what I'm proposing. Thank you, Michelle. Julian, that sounded like a design aspect as well. And I think we are about to close this panel now. We started with imbalance and I think we got wonderful ideas for new ways of balancing and trying out, creating something new together commonly. Um, what about your uh, perspective to it? You totally catch me on the wrong foot. I have nothing to answer actually at this very moment, so I will just not do that. Instead, mm -hmm. I will thank you for the question though. Instead, I will <laughs> thank you, Michelle, Susanna, and Richard, I, particularly for the last round. I will test those um, comments on my kit tomorrow and, um, and see where it takes us. I'm really looking forward to that. And Annette, thank you for the great um, moderation. I really enjoyed the session and from the comments I can see all the audience did so too. If any of you are available to join the Telegram chat after the session for a little bit, that would be great.